welcome to Asasaba, a podcast that honors oral tradition and shines light on Ghanaian culture and stories that are often untold or silenced. I'm your host, Michelle, and my pronouns are she and her. So welcome to the final episode of season one. This is episode five. Um, if you haven't listened to the previous four episodes, go listen to it right now. They're all really, really interesting conversations with a variety of different Ghanaian folks and um, they're telling their stories and it's really candid, honest, amazing. So yeah, go check out those stories. Go check out those episodes. Once again, thank you to everyone that has supported the podcast. Like, it really means a lot to me when I read um, messages about the podcast and how you enjoy, how you're enjoying it, what you like about it, all of that. Like, it means so much to me. I start cheesing so hard when I read those really, really um, nice comments and messages. So, yeah. So sharing goes a long way. So if you're enjoying the show, enjoying Asasaba, know someone who will like it, tell them, tell them about it, you know, spread the word about the podcast. Tell your auntie, your sister, your brother, your cousin, your coworker, your friend, whoever, like, if you're on Instagram, like post it on your IG stories and say, hey, I'm listening to this really dope Ghanaian podcast called Asasaba. Check it out. Or if you're on Twitter, share the link and say, hey, check this out. I'm listening to it right now. Asasaba is really dope. Um, go listen to it, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, just so just share and subscribe as well wherever you're listening to the podcast so that you can keep up to date on on things, right? So this is season, season one finale. This is episode five. Um, so wow. I, I like, I can't believe it. I feel like it's been a long time, but at the same time, it's not because like five episodes, but I don't know. It's just so weird and surreal to me. Um, but yeah, this is, the final episode of season one. I will definitely be back for season two, but you know, I'm going to take a break. So if you want to keep up to date on when the uh, show returns, subscribe, subscribe on Apple, subscribe on Spotify, on Google, CastBox, Stitcher, wherever you're listening to this podcast, subscribe so that you can uh, get notified when a new episode drop when the new season drops, you know? And, you know, when you post about Asasaba on social media, use the hashtag Asasaba pod so that I can see, you know, your commentary and other people can see it and everything just to keep that conversation going. So, yes, welcome to episode five. Ooh, this is a good episode. Um, So... In this episode, I interview Auntie Madame, who is a dear family, dear auntie to me. Um, and I wanted to interview an elder in the community because we need to hear the stories of our elders, you know? They are such an important part in Ghanaian society, Ghanaian community, and they have a lot of wisdom and, and, you know, knowledge and experiences that we, you know, I'm speaking as a youth, as a, a person who is young. Like, there are a lot of things that we can learn from them, you know? And, you know, they can learn some things from us as well. But uh, specifically right now in this episode, I interview an elder and we can learn a lot from our elders, right? So I thought it was so important to have someone, um, someone like Auntie Madame, who is so vivacious, who is so honest and candid and raw. Auntie Madame has such a vibrant personality and she just has a lot of wisdom so and experience. So I thought it'd be so awesome to interview her and also have her as the last episode of season one, just to, you know, round out the interviews and also um, just to further highlight and emphasize uh, what the mission of this podcast is, which is oral tradition, telling the stories of Ghanaian folks, including our elders. 
So I was super, super excited to interview her, um, you know, because she's so cool and she's just such a, she just has such a great aura and she has such a vibrant personality and she's funny, she's entertaining um, and she has a lot of wisdom, as I said. So this is such a great interview. And during my conversation with Auntie Madame, we discuss her childhood growing up in Kumase, her dreams of being a newscaster, becoming a teacher in Ghana, her boarding school experiences, immigrating to Canada in 1975, the discrimination she faced as a Black Ghanaian immigrant, her love of fashion, and also she provides uh, wisdom for the youth and so much more. We discuss a lot of things and, you know, she doesn't hold back. She's very honest and candid and raw, much like the other folks that I interviewed um, for season one. So with that said, here it goes. This is the final episode of season one of Asasaba, my interview with Auntie Madame. Today, I am here with Auntie Madame. Um, Auntie, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? The name is Madame Adwaye Boa, popularly known as Madame. The one and only Madame Adwaye Boa. And uh, I'm Elizabeth Jose Kwabena. I've been in uh, uh, Toronto here since 1975. And I'm still here trying to make a living with my family and friends. So, Auntie, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Ghana, West Africa, um, on the 16th of April, 1951. And I grew up in Kumasi. And, um, Auntie, like, tell me about your family, like, who your parents who raised you? Okay. I come from a family of five, five siblings. I'm the eldest. My mom was a school principal. My father was a businessman. So I grew into a family of five siblings, and I was the oldest. So, actually, I was raised from a family, very educative family in Kumasi. Because my parents, my mother especially, being a school principal, a school headmistress, that's the name we use for them, was very well educated. My dad, who was um, a businessman, wasn't that much educated like my mom. So I come from a family, or I came from a family that was very well educated. I will term it as a middle class family. Middle that's class. how middle okay. class, that's how I was raised. We weren't very rich, neither were we poor. Like it was uh, a decent family that I was raised into. And um what were you like as a child? If any of your siblings can, you know, uh, if they were here right now and we can ask them, what are some words that they will use to describe you when you were a kid? I was very talkative. Like uh, the time that I was supposed to crawl or walk, I, I was sitting on the floor all the time, talking, talking, talking. Instead of me uh, walking or crawling, I had the potential of mouthing out. I, I've been a talkative from my childhood. Mm -hmm. I've been very talkative. And then when they asked me for a name that was to be given to me, my parents were discussing a name that was supposed to be given to me. I'm the one at the age of 40, that chose a name for myself that I want to be called Elizabeth, to be named after the Queen of England. So I chose my name, my English name, or what they call it, my 
Not my surname. My surname is Oduro. That's the family name. But I chose my Christian name as Elizabeth because I've always felt like a queen and I wanted to be named after the Queen of England, Elizabeth. Okay, so Auntie, what's your um, your tree name? Ajua. Ajua. Ajua Yebua. Okay. I was named after my stepped mother. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so Auntie, you say you have a stepmother. Like, did your parents um, break up and then your dad remarried? or No, they never, never did. But okay. in Ghana, we don't term stepmothers somebody who your father married after your mom. Anyone that is in the family married to your uncle or your nephew, any member of the family who is married to the family, we term them as mothers. But nowadays we say stepmothers because they did not the one that produce you or bring you forth in the ninth month. But we consider them as stepmothers. Like they were not the one that carried you for the nine months. So we term them as stepmothers. Anyone that helped you in your growth is considered as a stepmother. So when you're a kid, you're this, you know, talkative kid, you know, you like mm -hmm. to do a bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. um, guessing you were very active. Very. What kind of things did you like to do for fun? During my early childhood, what I liked was to be a newscaster. Because we had a small radio, like a media, we call it nowadays. It's called Radio, Voice of Africa. And I've always wanted to be talking on the um, TV or the radio. We did not have TV at those times. So my real model was uh, Cranton Asante. She was a newscaster. So I told my mom that I want to grow up and be like Vida Cranton Asante to be giving out news, to be in the media. And guess what? My mom told me, how can you like to be growing up and be talking on the uh, radio? How many people listen to radio? Uh, how many people have radios? They don't because they could not afford it at that time. So it's useless that you want to be uh, a media um, person. She forced me to be a school teacher, but my life and all I wanted was to be a newscaster. But my mom discouraged me because not many people had um, that radio box to be listening to people. But that was my idea. Anytime I hear that Vida Cranton Asante giving Ghana speeches, announcing uh, the media, I was very much interested. Because this is how it went. Early in the morning from 7.30 to 8, all you hear is, Ghana Muntie, Ghana Muntie. This is Radio Broadcasting Corporation. We are here to announce this, blah, 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 blah. And I admire that lady so much. But my mom discouraged me because not many people had the radio box at that time when I was growing up. So I was discouraged being a, a media person. Oh, okay, so Auntie, how did you feel when, you know, you were discouraged? Like, is this your passion? You see um, Vida, is that her name? Um, Vida Cranton Asante was her name. Oh, okay, and you see her... That was my mentor. Okay, and you see her broadcasting and it's very mm -hmm. inspiring to you mm -hmm. but your mom is saying that that's not something you yeah. can do mm -hmm. how did that make you feel well i i had to listen to my mom mm -hmm. she was my mom so i had to listen to her and take her advice even though i did not agree with her i kind of uh agreed with her that not many people had um the radio box to be listening to the news, especially in the villages. 
So I kind of backed off from being a media person. Okay. And um, so I want to get into school. Like um, when you were a kid, what, what kind of school did you go to? And how were you like at school? Did you enjoy school? Yeah, I started my education from a primary school. And uh, at the age of 14, I went to a boarding school, which was all girls boarding school. It was called Mofretro Boarding School, where you meet all kinds of people, different tribes. So I wasn't uh, staying at home. I grew up outside my home in a boarding school where we were kept safe with different teachers teaching us not to be around our own homes to learn bad habits. So it's like we were being monitored in a boarding school. We term it as a boarding school where you don't grow up with other kids in our neighborhood. So I was isolated to be in a school where we pay fees, we have our own beds, we have our own dormitories, we have our... um, Dining areas where we are, we were fed three times a day and we pay for it. So I grew up in a very educated uh, family where it, we term it as boarding school. You don't go home. You stay there all your life until there's vacation. Then you, you, you are allowed maybe a month, six weeks to see your parents interact with them, then you come back to the boarding school. So actually, you've been separated from your family to be with other family to be educated. That's what we term it as boarding school. Okay, and Mofretro. 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 Is it in, um, what city was it in? It's in Kumasi. Oh, in Kumasi, okay. Yes. And so while you were attending that school, that was in the 60s. Yes, early 60s. early 60s. Yes. And you know like in Ghana like in the in 1960 um uh president Kwame Nkrumah became president and mm-hmm. there was a lot of change happening in Ghana. Mm-hmm. So at that time, what was it like for you, you know, like the first Ghanaian president? How what did that mean to you at that time when you were, you know, 14, 15 going to boarding school? He was a wonderful person, but I didn't understand the what he was doing for Ghana at that time of my age, because I was only uh, 12 years, 13, 14 to 14 years, right? So I wasn't much into politics. All I knew is we had a president with the name Osajo Fukwame Nkrumah. Even in schools, our national anthems, his name had to be concluded. When we were given the pledge, every morning, swearing an oath, I would say, like, pledging, like, uh, to sing anthem. We call it national anthem to boost us up. This is Ghana. This is Ghana. Our beautiful Ghana. There's love everywhere in Ghana. It's something like encouraging us to know that we are from Ghana. We have to work together. We have to respect our elders and build up the nation of Ghana. That was what we called the national anthem of Ghana. Every morning at school, from 7 o'clock in the morning after breakfast, we have to sing this national anthem. It was like a pledge. While you're, you know, um, in boarding school, what did you like to do? for fun in boarding school. What was the social scene there? We were trained to such a way that we get together, they teach us all the things that was going on uh, in Ghana at that time. Mm -hmm. We had special uniforms that we wear to churches. When a president that was uh, Kwame Nkrumah at that time was showing up any place in the public, we have to hold the Ghana flag, wave it to him, like receive him with respect that he was the leader 
of our nation at that time. So we were trained to go on March pass and our parents or the family or the school teachers, they formed something that is called the Young Pioneers. Young Pioneers. The Young Pioneers, to my understanding these days, is the future, the future uh, people or the future uh, representatives to replace our forefathers. So we were trained to act in case they are not around anymore. So we called it Ghana pioneers, like beginners. Okay. You're in school, you know, um, you're a teenager, maybe making friends. How, how was that like? Did you have any like solid friendships or anything or any relationships while you were in school? We were all like family. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter where a person is from. We all grew up together. We shared ideas. We had different type of people, like different tribes. Anybody who could afford to bring their child to the school and pay for their fees, we don't discriminate and say, this one is an Arab, this one is a God, this is an Ashanti. So long as your parents are able to afford to keep you inside the school, to be trained in a decent way. Not to go to a public school, we did not discriminate. So we all messed up together, and we called ourselves a family of a boarding decent school, which was Mofretro Girls at that time. Was that your first time being exposed to um, different uh, tribes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Did you learn anything about um, other tribes while you were there? Yes, I did. I realized that uh, different tribes act differently. They all have their ideas of how they act, but they did not separate us from any tribe. We all learned from each other. We were learning from each other. We interacted to be together. Good. So you're learning, you're exposed to different cultures. Exactly. And learning about yeah. each other and stuff. That's really nice. Is there anyone that you remember, like from boarding school, who you're still friends with till to this day? A whole lot of them. Yeah. Because what happened is uh, after two years of schooling in the boarding school, we sit for common entrance. The common entrance is how we get to the level of going to secondary school. So we sit for an exam, they choose uh, maybe four schools, and God being so good, it happened that majority of the youth that was in the boarding school happened to be in the same secondary school after the elementary school in, at Mofretro. So we kept in touch, and the secondary school is for five years. Five years. So from the two years of the boarding elementary, we all happen, most of us happen to be in the secondary school, like continuing education. We were continuing our education. Were there any activities that um, you guys were doing? I know like boarding school, they they might have been, they were, were they strict there? Were the teachers and the, you know, were they all strict? Did they enforce a lot of rules? Oh, they did. Yeah. But <laughs> unfortunately, the school that I went to, that was in the capital of Ghana, which was Accra, people termed it as uh, a school with bad girls because there were a lot of uh, ministers' kids there. There were a lot of rich kids over there. So we always wanted our freedom. Freedom, 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 freedom. No matter how strict the teachers were, we could care less because it's our parents' family, our parents' money that was uh, helping us out with our education, right? So somehow, we were very stubborn kids at that time. Did you say Accra? Is this another school that you went to? Yeah, it's it's a very popular school. Uh, It's called Accra Girls Secondary School. Uh, it's next to Achimota Secondary School. Okay, so what what age were you when you went to 
left my first show and went to the Accra. 16. 16. Okay. What are the things that you did to kind of break the rules and like do your own thing as a young adult there? You know what? We were supposed to be on Eziat, we call it. The Eziat means getting out of the school compound to be outside. You have to get permission. And if you don't get permission and you go outside, we used to uh, climb fence. I don't know what they call it nowadays. Like they built a fence that we jumped over the fence. Somehow we have to sneak. Because when you go and ask permission to go outside the school compound, you are not allowed. We were allowed so many times within the three months of the boarding um, restrictions. When you go and ask for Eziat, Eziat means like going out of the compound to do your own thing because they've been assigned to take care of you or to protect you from outside world, we were not allowed. So we have to sneak out and go and do our own thing outside. And when you are caught, you are punished. So what kind of things did you do when you snuck out? <laughs> we, we go to night, uh, a nightclub, student nightclubs. At that age, we we're not even supposed to go there late in the night. So you know what we did? We have our boarding school, we have our beds. So you pretend you put a dolly on the bed, you cover it up as if it's you lying down. So when the teachers come for inspection to make sure that you are on your bed, you are not the person there. Meanwhile, you've laid down a dolly with sheets covered, thinking that you are there, but meanwhile, you are outside the school compound, <laughs> messing up with whoever we wanted to mess up at that time. You know, like we had to sneak out of the compound because if you're caught, that's a big problem for you. So we, we have to lay our pillows, make it like uh, a dolly or human beings, and then we sneak out of the compound mm -hmm. to go and meet, you know, whoever we wanted to meet at that time, 16 years old. 16, yeah, who I'm were you telling. meeting? <laughs> ah, well, you know, some of the bad boys too, who were in uh, other schools, okay, you know, for okay. dating and stuff like that. Like uh, nowadays we say Facebook friends. <laughs> you have to, you know, start from somewhere. Right. In the nightclub, what kind of music were they playing? Hey! What was popular at the time? Twist. It's called the twist. Mm -hmm. It's a special dance. They still do it these days. We call it the cha-cha-cha. And rock and roll. Some, some uh, late dance that we used to do at the club at that time. So we just go, we listen to live bands. Uh, there was no CD media, something to play music, right? So we did have live bands. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, at that time, there was no telephone. At that time, there was no microphone, like no internet and stuff like that. So we listened to live bands. We danced to Twist. Cha cha cha, and rock and roll. Nice. That sounds, mm -hmm. that sounds like Should be checker. Times. Ooh, let's twist again. Oh, I actually know you that did song. Last summer. <laughs> let's twist again. Something like that, you know. <laughs> As we did last year. Ooh, you know, we had fun. I'm telling you. Were there um, any local Ghanaian? Uh, music that you guys listen to or not that time our mothers our parents used to listen to that we call it as a cake we say a cake a cake means uh expired really? <laughs> at that time a cake it means it's not a trend we we never hardly did anyone listen to those old high life music 
Okay. Mm-hmm. So at the time, even at the time, there wasn't any like popular Ghanaian um, musicians. Nah. Or, okay. Nah. Um, so it sounds like there was a lot of American influence. Oh, yes. In the music there was. And in the dance. Chubby Checker. Yep. Yeah. We used to listen to that. Okay. So what was your view of America then? Because you had so much of the American influence in your media and your music and all of that. What did you think of America at the time? What was your vision of it? I thought America was the end of the world. We looked at them as the greatest. We look at them like the the, the world. Because everything, America, America, America. So we, that's how we listen to their music and their influence and their dancing. Oh, everything was America. We look at them like they were our leaders at that time. So you were in um, that school, Accra Girls, until mm-hmm. how? Until what age? I can't remember the age, but I, I graduated at the age uh, at the date of nineteen. 69. 1969. Okay. Yes. So what was it like to be finished? So that was the end of high school. That was the end of high school. Okay. So what was it like to finish high school for you? How did well, you feel? Well, the high school, because of my lifestyle, I didn't do that much great. When I was in high school, I was too much into company influence. So um, I decided to go to teacher's training because my mom was a school principal. So I made admission to a training college to be trained as a school teacher. That was my choice. Okay. To be a school teacher. And at that time, did you still have um, lingering dreams about being a a broadcaster or were you Yes, I've I've always, I've always had the dream of being a newscaster. Mm -hmm. I've always, but it looks like I was forced into going to the training college. If my mom had allowed me to do the media work, I could have been somewhere better than uh, how I went to the training college. It looked like I was forced into what I did not want to do. Because to be honest with you, I never liked being a teacher. I've always liked the media work. But I wasn't given the chance. You have to listen to your parents. I want you to be a school teacher. You have to be a school teacher. Because my mom was a school principal or a school headmistress. And she wanted all her kids. Out of the family of five, four of us went to teacher's training college. Yeah, we were all forced into it, which I never liked, but it looked like you have to listen to your parents at that time. Did your father also feel like you should go to teacher's training? No. My father was so free with us that he could care less. Okay. It's my mom that forced us. For five of us, four of us, went to teacher's training because she wanted us to follow her footsteps. And um, so once you finish uh, teacher's training, you you taught for how long? A year. A year? Mm -hmm. Okay. How was it like being a teacher, especially since it wasn't what your passion was, right? So how did it feel to go into something that was not necessarily your passion? I had no choice because I was uh, spoken into or I was advised to do the best that I could to help other kids. And it looked like uh, after the schooling, after my teacher's training, most of the students liked me because they see me as a young teacher who could inspire them. So the love that the students showed me made me, you know, adjusted myself to being a school teacher, which I only thought for about a year. And then I was sponsored back here in uh, Toronto. So what age group were you teaching? At the age of um, 20, 21. Okay. And wh- how old were the kids that you were teaching? 
9 to 11. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, so you did that for a year. Exactly. And then you said you were sponsored. Mm -hmm. Um so what made you decide to to Canada? What made me decide to come to Canada was yeah. um my childhood friend or boyfriend was here and I wanted to make a better life for myself and then uh closer to the American people to learn something to better out my life. That's why I left the teaching field because they didn't pay that much anyways. So I thought I could get a better life by coming to Toronto uh, here. And how did your family feel when they heard that you were going to Canada? They were happy. They were very, very happy because me coming to Canada could help them also to follow my footsteps or to give them the opportunity to join me in the future. Oh, yeah, okay. they, they felt that it's a good opportunity. Once their big sister gets here, they will follow up too by coming here to seek for a better future. What, when did you arrive in Canada? What was the... Sometime year? in uh, 75. 75. Mm -hmm. So when you stepped off the plane, <laughs> you know, this is your first time um, outside of, was it your first time outside of Ghana? Yes. And you came to Canada. What were your initial thoughts when you stepped out of the plane and saw all of these in Rofo 4? <laughs> Whoa, and I was in heaven. Woo, look at the buildings. Look at the cars. Look at all the people. The, the, uh, I would say uh, white people, but look at the different type of people that uh, I saw at the airport. Look at the announcement. And that was my first time in the plane. My experience in the plane was very scary. But somehow I got here and woo, here am I in another world. Beautiful world. Yeah, so you came in 1975. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, were there um, a lot of Ghanians here? Or what would you say the amount of Ghanians? Like, no. Were there a lot? No, there wasn't a lot. Okay. There wasn't many people from Ghana here. Most of them were in Europe. Okay. So did you have any... Um, you said you had a, a boyfriend that sponsored you? Yes. Um, was that... Was he, like, the only person you knew in Canada? Or are there other yeah, people? Yeah, he was the only person I knew. Okay. Until I got introduced to other uh, people okay. after a while. So how did you, you know, it, it, might, it must have been lonely sometimes. Did you feel it was lonely? Like not having that many Ghanaian people here, especially coming from Ghana? It wasn't lonely at all. The reason being that uh, he had friends. He was here before me. So he had friends that he introduced me to, and some of them knew my mom. So we kind of got together as a, a family, and it was fun. Okay, that's good. Um, so in the 70s, um, I, I imagine there weren't that many black people in general in Canada. So what was it like being a Ghanaian immigrant, a black woman, uh, living here in the 70s? It was kind of hard. Because at that time, we were not given the opportunities that they had. I thought me coming to Canada here with the educational background that I had, as soon as I enter Canada, I tell them I was a school teacher. I went to training college. I went to secondary school. I could have walked in to an office or to a school to be a school teacher. But at that time, in the early 70s, not much chance was given to black immigrants. No. no okay. They always requested for uh, another exams before they introduce you to the system. It wasn't that easy. No, we were not allowed. 
what did you do to sustain yourself while you were here since you weren't um, allowed to, you know, be a teacher like you were in Ghana? What did you do to, you know, make money and have a life here? I worked at a low paying jobs to make ends lit, you know, eat meat. I had to work in factories. I had to be a dishwasher, something below my level of education. Because I had no choice. My husband was a student at that time at York University. And I had to support him by doing a dishwashing job, by working at McDonald's, anything that could get me money. And uh, people were telling me, how come you were a school teacher back home in Africa and now you are here doing dishwashing? That's the time I explained to them that the accent, the accent alone, pardon me, pardon me, it did not allow me or gave me the privilege to be a school teacher at that time because I had an accent, which I still do up to date because I didn't grow up here. So the accent was a barrier for me being a school teacher. When you arrived here, you mentioned your husband. So you formed your family in Canada? Yes, I did. And do you want to talk about your family? Yeah, I have a wonderful family. I have my sisters and my brothers here. I brought them here. They were all sponsored here into Canada. At that time, it was very simple and easy to bring your family member here. So they all joined me here. And thank God, everyone is doing fine. That's how I got my family here. They also got their children here. So we formed our own family here through me. I had to get the opportunity to be here, then give them the chance or the opportunity also to join me so our family keeps growing, growing. So we are here, five of us, and everyone is doing great. That's good. You know, when you were here in the 70s, and just about talk more about community and the Ghanaian community, you said your um, partner had friends already here, and that's how you met other people. Mm -hmm. But were there any other, like, um, maybe either organizations or community groups that um, allowed you or made it easier for you to connect with Ghanaian folks? At that time, it, to me, at that time, it was like a competition. Nobody wanted, it was like a competition to me. At those days, there was not much help coming from our community. It looked like we all came here for a purpose to be successful or to make it to the top. It's not like now. Now, it looks like we are helping each other. But before when we came, it was like a competition. Mm -hmm. It was. If I had gotten advice at that time when I came, there were certain things that I was doing. If I was advised by some friends or some family, I could, I could have been a better person than now. But there wasn't much interaction like these days. No. It looks like we were in a competition. Everybody wants to be somebody because we all had a chance to come here to make a living to impress our family back home and stuff like that. Okay. So I, I don't trust the uh, 70s. How long were you here until your family joined you? Just about five years. Okay. And within that five years, um, was it hard, you know, like, because you come from a, a pretty big family. Was it hard not having your family here with you or... How did you feel about them not being here? It wasn't hard. It wasn't hard? No, it okay. wasn't hard. Because I met other people mm -hmm. that I became friends with. So it was okay. So I guess we can talk about, like, now, the present day. So 
um, the reason why I wanted to interview you, you know, you're such a figure in the community and, you know, um, you're like an auntie to my mom and she always you Thank know, you. says how generous and kind you are oh. and you know your auntie you're like a fashionista at these oh events God. I always notice your fashion all oh of that oh my goodness so you're seen as this like free spirited oh you know, my God. Don't, 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 don't make me cry <laughs> like you know I wish I could do more I wish the very moment that she told me that you were coming to do some interview with me, I was so excited. I was so excited. It makes me feel important. I, it makes me feel that I, I can be useful. It me, and uh, since yesterday, I've had three people that had approached me about their engagement, their African marriage. They came to me for advice. And it makes me feel good about myself that I'm loved, I'm respected, and people appreciate me. That's all I want. I'm not after anything. All I want is unity, like yeah. family bond. It makes me more happy than even eating or getting rich. All I care is my family. Not only the family that I sponsored here. But anybody who appreciates me for whatever I am and comes to me that this is our big sister, it makes me more happy than being rich. Uh, that's really good to hear. And, um, yeah. you know, it's a pleasure interviewing you because I hear so much about you, like good things and all that. So... Um, I was like, yeah, I got to interview. I'm so happy when you, thank you. Agreed to be interviewed. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I, I, I feel honored. It's, I, I'm honored. I'm very happy. Thank you so much. Um, I actually had, uh, some more questions. Um, okay. Cause I feel like there's a gap cause we talked about when you arrived here in the seventies mm -hmm. and, uh, we, you know, transitioned to now, mm -hmm. but, how did your experience in Canada change in the 80s, then in the 90s, and then now? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, the 80s, mm -hmm. the 90s, and now. Yeah. In the 80s, a lot of Ghanaians immigrated to Canada. So there was an influx of Ghanaian folks here. Um what was your experience like? Because I know the seventies, there weren't that many Ghanaian people there here. So, what was it like when you saw you started seeing more people immigrating? Yeah, I was kind of happy because I did had the chance to see some of our schoolmates, some old friends that I knew back home. They all came, so I was happy to see them. We had more people coming in to Canada here. Yeah, at that time, in the 80s. Okay. And what was everyone doing for fun? What was the social scene like at that time for you? We used to party a lot. Party a lot. There wasn't much funerals, but these days all you, you hear is, oh, funeral, funeral, funeral. At that time, there wasn't even uh, outdoors. We call it outdoors, like people have kids. It wasn't like that. It was like parties, get together. That's what we call them. Nothing like funerals or birthday parties and stuff like that. No, we used to get together, barbecue and stuff like that. That's nice. And um, did, you know, because you, you were saying that you were working um, a bunch of different jobs mm -hmm. because, they were barring you from, you know, pursuing a teaching um, mm -hmm. career. So did that change or were you um, working those jobs? Like you, you said you were working as a dishwasher and you were working oh, at yes. McDonald's. Yes. What were you doing in the 80s? In the 80s, I decided that to go to school so that I could get into the Canadian system of being a school teacher or a better job than the dishwashing that I was doing. So I went to Toronto School of Business to be a hotel and restaurant management. In the school, it was 
35 students, only five blacks. They were all, I'm not racist, but they were all Canadians, I should put it. So the dark skinned people, that was five of us that went to the school, Toronto School of Business, to work in an industry where we will be noticed or where we will feel a better job with our educational background. We all finished Toronto School of Business. I was the student of the month in restaurants at that time in the 80s. But guess what? Out of the five uh, dark-skinned people that went to Toronto School of Business, none of us was allowed to work in the public area. I would say either it was racism or prejudice. They were pre I don't know, for some reason, none of us got into the industry. We were never given the chance. I went to Toronto School of Business. Yes, I was student of the month in restaurant. I was very good. I was very brilliant. Some of the uh, Canadians that were in the school, they had the good accent to express themselves. I had an accent, but I could write better than them. But because of my skin at that time, I don't know. I was not given the uh, chance or the opportunity to work at the front decks. None of us got into that field. That's how I ended up ignoring the hotel and restaurant management, which has been my pride always to meet the media, to make big shows, to meet the celebrities uh, coming from the States. We were never given the chance at that time. So I ended up working in a, a plant. And that must have been very, like, painful. Because, very. Up to yeah. date. Up to date. Because my daughter asked me one question at one time. She goes, Mom, you used to, I heard you used to be a school teacher. I heard you have a grade 13. How come you are working in a factory? How come you are working in a factory? So I explained to her that I was never given the chance to work with the public or the media or anything like that. We were not given the chance. And it looks like I wasn't the only person that was not given the chance to work with the media. We were never given the opportunity. I even knew some Ghanaian doctors back home, that came in the early 80s. They had to start from the lab up to date. If you immigrate from Ghana as a, a specialist, a surgeon, and you enter Toronto, Canada, there's no way they're going to put you at the Toronto uh, Hospital or St. Margaret's Hospital to work as a, a full qualified doctor. No, you have to get from somewhere. You have to start from somewhere. We are always underneath. I can mention names of Ghanaian doctors that I knew back home when I was in school that I worked in the same factory with them. And mm -hmm. painful too. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you must have also felt angry. I know I would. Um, did you feel like you had, you know, people to talk to about this? Did you feel that you had a way of, um, I guess, expressing all that like anger and, and like pain and all of that from all, all the years of discrimination and racism? Actually, I, I gave up and accepted for the fact that I had an accent. I accepted for the fact that when you speak, right, sometimes people say, pardon me, pardon me. So I used to be mad and I get a pen or paper and I write it down because I, I can express myself on paper 
more than the accent. So I accepted for the fact that I did have an accent. That's why I wasn't given the, the chance because you can't put me as a lawyer or as a school teacher, put me in a high school to continue my education and be talking to my students in an accent where they would not understand. So I accepted it, that English was a second language, that if I wanted to go ahead, it's better to start from the beginning and get the accent. That way, you can be okay. So I accepted that. And to me, anyhow you make money is what matters. All I cared about is making uh, money for my living. I could care less about whatever office or field that I had to work. How long were you working in the plant for? 18 years. 18 years. Okay. At that point, did you stop trying to, I guess, get those credentials that they're telling you to get in order to advance? Because, you, you know, you mentioned you accepted yeah, I gave up. Just, I okay. never tried anything again. Okay. You mentioned that, like, you wrote, because, you you know, you like expressing yourself, and you did that through writing. So that was your outlet, you know? That's how you express yourself. Mm -hmm. um, do you still do that to this day? No. No? No. What, because... did, what did writing do for you at that time when you were feeling all of those feelings because of the... I felt, re I, I felt kind of relieved. I felt like, okay, this is two choices. Either you speak or you write. And then the writing uh, could um, forward my expression and my anger or my concerns to other uh, factors. It helped me because I was able to express myself in another field. It helped me to uh, feel good about myself that, hey, if I have the accent, at least I can write. No spelling mistakes. So that, that it helped me by expressing myself on the papers. What were you doing after you, you know, you finished working at the plant? You said you did that for about 18 years. <laughs> what were you doing after? Well, unfortunately, I had a accident I had an accident two years ago I was hit by a forklift on my job and I've already reached the age of retirement so at this time I would say I'm on retirement <laughs> <As you should be. laughs> I'm on retirement yeah. now I feel like working, I feel strong enough that I say, hey, I can do something better to make more money with myself. But unfortunately, the age caught up on me, so I'll consider myself as a retiree. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. I see you want bread, probably. My bread, right? my bread, so... my bread, my bread. <laughs> my bread. Um, my bread. So, Auntie, what does retirement look for you, like, look for you right now? Like, what... What are you doing these days, or how are you relaxing and enjoying um, your retirement? Anything that happens to me, all I want now is to enjoy the little life that I have left, which I don't, I don't know. I want to enjoy my, I've suffered too much. I need to relax and enjoy the later part of my life now. And I see you enjoying yourselves during some of the Ghanaian events. You know, you come, you're saying that you're a fashionista. <laughs> you come in your outfits. I see you're always looking good. Thank you. Is fashion Thank something you. that you really Thank like? you. I love fashion. Yeah. I love fashion. Even when I was in school, I used to go to used clothing stores and buy used clothes. Because I always want to have something new on, something different on. Up to date, I like uh, fashion. I really do. Yeah, I <laughs> That's do. That's good because it's certainly you're always having all you have all these <laughs> nice looks. I'm like, oh, Auntie, can I borrow? I think we're oh, the same size. <laughs> <laughs> anytime, baby. Anytime, man. Anytime. Mm -hmm. Anytime. 
I told your mom once that I have some kente, 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 kente. I have I lots. Okay. I have about eight of them that's not been touched. Oh, wow. I, lo- I love kente. Yeah. I have them. About 50 of them. Because mm-hmm. when you reach certain age, right, right? There are certain clothes, there are certain clothes that you cannot put on. Mm-hmm. You, you have to wear the traditional something to your level. I used to wear short skirts, mini skirts, but now I can't do them anymore, right? Because I, my daughter see me in some dress and she goes, yeah. you know, there are certain clothes that you cannot wear. At certain age, you have to respect yourself. I, I, you, I don't like to expose myself, right? I, I'm, I'm definitely down to look into your collection and borrow oh. anything. Me, you know. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> I'm glad you showed up here, and I'll be happy to see you very now and then. Anytime, you, I would love to for you to come. We go into the closet, uh, and we see what. We can do. I, will, I will take that. you up on that offer. Anytime. I'm not. I'm not joking okay. with you. You know. I'm not joking. <laughs> mm. Um. So I just have one uh, question to round out this interview. So, what words of wisdom, you know, given all your experience, what words of wisdom would you give to Ghanaian women today? Okay. With my people from Ghana. What I would say is um, it's not the end of the world. And all fingers are not equal. So don't ever feel that you are behind or I'm from Ghana or this I cannot do. We still have time to improve ourselves. Let's be together, unite, and work things for each other. Elderly people can take advice from the youth. The youth can take advice from us. What I've realized is my children or my grandchildren, they show more love and concern than us, the uh, elderly people or the people that were here earlier. So I always want to be around the youth and I feel more comfortable being around the youth of nowadays. Because it looks like we are in competition. No. We have to support our children. We have to teach them the wrong things we did in the past. Like me, I'm not embarrassed to teach them the wrong things I did in the past. If I had been smarter or I would listened to elderly people or people that are, are good in the community, I would have been in a better position. So nobody is permanent now. Let's all get together, learn from each other, correct ourselves, and build a future world or generation by teaching our children the mistakes we did in the past and what they have to do not to be in the past mistake that I made. Don't let force them to be what they, they don't want to be because I wanted to work in the media. My mom did not allow me. If she had allowed me, probably I would have been uh, uh, in the uh, Hollywood. My daughter finished university and the father did not want her to be her wedding decor, the creator, whatever they call it, because he is thinking that, oh, she finished York University, so she should be working in the bank. She should be this. She should be that, that, that. So we were upset that how could you finish university and be working for uh, as a wedding planner? But she's making more money than uh, working in, in the bank. So let's allow our children to be free, make their choices, even in marriage, in relationship, anything they want to do, let's allow them to be free so that they don't repeat the mistakes that we did in the past. Those are really great words of wisdom. Thank you so much. I thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Um, you. All right, so thank you so much for listening to the final episode of season one of Asasiba. 
wasn't this such a great interview? Like, I love Auntie Madame. She's so cool. Um, so yeah, I will be taking a break before launching season two. Um, as I said at the start of the show, because, you know, wow, kudos to those folks who produce a podcast and host and edit and do everything like every week because, you know, it's a lot of labor and yeah, but so I'm practicing what I preach and, you know, taking a break and, you know, so that I can just relax and, <laughs> uh, you know, when you, when you take a break, like that's when, you know, you can, your mind gets rejuvenated and like come up with new, fresh ideas and content and stuff. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to be taking a couple months break. I'm not exactly sure when I'll be back, but it will, I will definitely be back for season two and I will be back soon. So stay tuned, subscribe to the podcast so you can know when season two drops and follow Assassin Pod at Assassin Pod on Twitter to keep up to date on things. And, you know, I'll be, I'll still be active on the Twitter page. Um, yeah, tweeting things and, and that jazz. Maybe not like every single day, but you know, just, you know, just to keep things going, right? Um, so yeah, I will return. I hope everyone enjoyed season one of Asasaba. And if you have any comments or feedback or anything like that, you can email asasabapod at gmail.com or, you know, hashtag Pod on Twitter, on Instagram, on social media, and, you know, just so that I can see it, and other people can see it as well. And yes, yes, season one, Asasaba. Like, I've learned so much from being a podcaster. Yeah, so these are our five interviews, uh, five episodes, and even though there weren't a lot of episodes, there was a lot of like thought and production and um, thinking that went behind me producing this podcast and producing season one. Like even during this short time that I've been doing this podcast in season one, once again, like oral tradition is so important, like documenting our stories, you know, having listening to something someone different experiences or even hearing people echo back things that you feel that you didn't really think existed but it is there because people are talking about their stories it's just so important like a lot of these interviews and I was like acting as a host and all that it really resonated with me you know and it was really important for me to hear a lot of the the things that um, the different folks I interviewed were talking about. And I really hope this resonated with you as well, whoever is listening. And if it did, again, like share, share with people, you know, it's so important to like highlight the stories of, you know, marginalized folks and people who are often silenced or told that they're not Ghanaian enough or Ghanaian because of their identity, you know, which is all BS, clearly. So it's just been really good for me to um, really emphasize and illuminate the stories of people in the margins and to let folks know that they're not alone that we're not alone you know so yeah <laughs> that's my little spiel <laughs> to round out this season and thank you so much once again to all of those that have supported the podcast and amplified it on twitter or you know shared it on uh instagram or shared it with their friends, told people about it. I really, really appreciate that. 
and I will see you very soon. Stay tuned for season two. Um, this is Michelle speaking, your host, producer, editor, creator of Asasaba, and see you for season two. Stay tuned. Bye.